<laughs> this is really I don't know if that settings changed though. Otherwise we'll leave, we'll need to tell people, I guess, yeah. to go to some uh, other location. No, no, the link stays the same. Okay. We'll probably key just change. Uh, so it's so I see. We'll see. Okay, it's a starting. I, I, oh no, I can see it now. Okay, uh, Juan, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Honor. Okay. Uh, live stream is already working. Okay, I guess we're also live. And uh, do we have students in the room also? So maybe I, I'll admit them all. Maybe you can do that also. I can do it. Okay, yeah, can you do that? Okay, we had some technical difficulties. Yes, I can hear you, Honor. Uh, okay, live stream is already working. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, uh, wait. Okay, I think we can finally get started. Let me turn on my camera. Also over here, can people see me or can people hear me? Okay, great, I hear a lot of, I see a lot of yes votes. So that means that something is going on. Uh, that's good. We're also live on YouTube. That was the reason why we were delayed uh, a little bit, unfortunately, somehow the key changed on YouTube and we need to redo it. Okay, uh, so I think I'm gonna get started. Uh, and Juan, yeah, when people uh, enter, you can admit them through the waiting room. I see some people uh, still coming in. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of participants, that's great. Okay, uh, well, welcome everyone uh, for the first lecture of digital design and computer architecture. Uh, we're doing it online uh, again. Last year we started in person, uh, but then we switched to online. This year, we're also doing live streaming on YouTube, so you can actually do it uh, over, you can actually watch it over there. And if you're, if you're not at ETH also, you're very much welcome to watch uh, this lecture or also future lectures as well. Okay, so this is going to be digital design and computer architecture. It's a bachelor's course, second semester. If you're at ETH, you probably know that very well. It's a required course. Uh, and let me first start introducing myself. Uh, I'm a professor at ETH. Uh, it's been about five to six years uh, since I've been here. Before that, I was a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. I still have one PhD student left at Carnegie Mellon. And after that, I will not be at Carnegie Mellon officially, let's say. Uh, I got my PhD from UT Austin, worked at a bunch of companies during my PhD and after my PhD, as you can see, they're listed over here. So hopefully I will... Uh, bring about some of the industrial experience and industrial connections I have to the perspectives you will receive uh, in this uh, semester. And if in future semesters, if you decide to uh, take some other courses from us. Uh, I, uh, let's see, okay. Okay, if you can, you can reach me with this email address. I also have an ETH email address, but this tends to be more reliable in general. Uh, and you can find information on my website, including links to the, these, these classes, as you will see later on. I do research and teaching in computer architecture, computer systems, hardware security, and bioinformatics. 
We're going to talk a lot about computer architecture clearly here, uh, but we're going to also touch upon different aspects of computer architecture. We do a lot of work on memory and storage, hardware security, safety, predictability, fault tolerance, robust systems, hardware software cooperation, which is going to be important in this particular lecture, especially. And we, uh, we look into a lot of uh, architectures for bioinformatics, health, medicine, and intelligent decision making. So I'm quite excited about all of these areas. So uh, our current research mission is really building fundamentally better architectures, and that requires understanding all of the components of a modern computing architecture. And this course is really about the fundamentals of understanding uh, these computing architectures. Uh, so hopefully you'll be interested in all of the aspects of computer architecture as much as I am. So these are some uh, current directions we're following in my group, fundamentally secure, reliable, and safe architectures, fundamentally energy efficient architectures, more memory centric architectures, you will get exposed to it during this lecture and in the, uh, during the course as well. Uh, reducing the latency of existing architectures, making them much more predictable and robust, and uh, designing architectures for future applications like AI, ML, genomics, medicine, health, etc. Important applications. This is my research group. Actually, this is a picture that was taken before the pandemic. That's why everybody's uh, together, as you can see. Well, not, not everybody, because there's a remote component as well. You will see that uh, many of these uh, folks in the picture are actually are going to be your teaching assistants or student assistants. Uh, and this is the motto of the group, as you can see over here. Uh, and uh, we actually have a newsletter. If you are interested in learning about the group, you can read this newsletter. Hopefully, it's accessible uh, to folks who are just starting their uh, degrees, undergraduate degrees in computer science or electrical engineering. It should be interesting. And you can see that this is the current state of affairs with Zoom pictures. OK, I, I, let me introduce myself a little bit based on uh, where I'm coming from. Uh, hopefully, you can get a good idea of uh, your lecture. Uh, and that gives, me, it gives you an idea of my mindset. So I strongly believe in what's written on the slide. I believe teaching drives research, and research drives teaching. So innovation is all built on these two components in the end. So teaching drives research, meaning that by understanding the fundamentals, you can actually do something fundamentally better and improve the state of the art, uh, make lives better, as we will discuss. And research drives teaching because once you uh, actually uh, figured out a better way of doing things, that becomes a fundamental component of, for future generations. So research essentially, uh, research 10 years ago becomes education uh, 10 years later, let's say. So in a sense, teaching is all about uh, educating someone about things that you that is already known by almost everyone by essentially everyone let's say in the in the state of the art whereas research is very similar to teaching it's it's really about educating uh, folks about things that no one else other than you knows perhaps and i believe this is actually a very healthy uh, loop this is unfortunately my looping construct in uh, powerpoint there's a better construct you can clearly come up with but i like this one because it's clean uh, this, this is essentially a loop, basically, teaching and research feed each other uh, essentially forever. OK, uh, so uh, this is another principle. I fo we focus a lot of, on insight, and I encourage a lot of new ideas. So if you come up with any new ideas during the course of this course or later, feel free to contact me. Uh, uh, if you don't get a response, please contact me again, because uh, my email tends to be not so reliable, because I receive a lot of email, and it's not easy to respond to everything that comes. Uh, uh, focus on learning and scholarship. This is important. Clearly, you're just starting your studies, uh, especially if you're at ETH. So this is, I think, uh, a pillar. Uh, and on top of that, uh, I, uh, this is uh, what we do in my research group. I'd like to create an environment that values free exploration, openness, collaboration, hard work, and creativity. And I think these five pillars are in important for both teaching and research. Uh, and I think in the end, I'm a strong believer in the quality of what you produce. That really defines your impact uh, overall. And I think that that's again true for teaching and research. OK, so that's a little bit about philosophy. Uh, I have a lot of lectures online. If you're interested in learning more about some of these things uh, that we've already discussed, you can go and watch these lectures. I don't think a lot of them require a lot of background knowledge or background is given in those lectures. Some of these things we're going to cover. Uh, during the course of this uh, bachelor's course, but clearly we're not going to go extremely advanced uh, during this course. And uh, if you're interested in more views on computing research and education, you can actually watch this interview uh, that I gave to some students after receiving an award last, this is not last year anymore, it's uh, the previous year, 
uh, and they asked a lot of good questions. So uh, I like this interview a lot. And there's more. Uh, you can you can you can uh, you can see a lot of material basically on my website in terms of uh, what I think about topics. Okay, so how to approach this course? Let me uh, also uh, mention this because. The co this course is not an easy course. It's a heavy course. Clearly, ETH is a top place, and uh, especially the first year classes are not easy. Uh, but these are some of the words that were used by uh, previous takers of this course. They found it a formative experience. And I like this two uh, word phrase because I think this is a really great way of approaching this course. In the end, your grades, yes, are going to be important because unfortunately, you're going to be evaluated based on an exam in this course. But I think the best way of approaching this course is really uh, taking it as a formative experience. And hopefully exam uh, success will come along the way. Uh, unfortunately, yes, you have to pass the exam uh, so that you can continue your studies. But I think uh, this course has a bigger role uh, than just an exam in the end. Think of this as a formative learning experience. And this is another set of words that was used by one of your peers who took this course in the past. They said it's high investment, high return. And I think in banking terms, it's not a bad an, uh, analysis. And I also like thinking of this as a, essentially a learning experience. So I would like to reduce the focus on the exams and the grades, uh, but focus more on the learning experience. And hopefully you will get to learn long-term trade-off analysis. And hopefully that will enable, uh, I think my big focus is going to be on critical thinking and decision-making. And hopefully this course will enable you to, uh, with the skills uh, that, toward that direction, because we will cover a lot of concepts in computer architecture and design. And I believe those concepts are actually much more generalizable uh, than the limited uh, field of computer architecture that we are dealing with today. OK, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, we're going to cover concepts and ideas. We're going to focus a lot on fundamentals because this is the first course. We're also going to talk about cutting edge because I believe that fundamentals and cutting edge also relate to each other. Today's cutting edge is going to be tomorrow's fundamentals. Uh, and I think hands-on learning is going to be important because you're going to do the labs and do the hands-on learning during the labs. Uh, so this course actually brings you the conceptual view as well as the hands-on learning view. So it's, hopefully it's going to be a good experience for uh, people and hopefully you're excited about it. Now, uh, having said that, uh, if you have taken this course in the past and if you have done the labs, I would not encourage you to do the labs again because that's going to be additional work. If you, well, if you've already done well in the labs, I would encourage you to use your grade. And uh, my TAs are actually uh, uh, posted something on Moodle so that you can say, okay, I'm, I'm going to use my grade from the past as opposed to doing the labs. And again, if you've, done, if you've gotten a really good grade, I would suggest using your grade. Uh, hopefully you learned basically in the end. Okay, so now uh, with that background, let me jump into what we will learn in this course. I'm, I must also mention that my lectures tend to be relatively high bandwidth. Uh, I've, I've, uh, this was mentioned to me many times in the past, uh, but I think the best way of approaching them is really not trying to take notes, not trying to read everything on the slides, but trying to take this as, uh, as more of an experience, like, uh, like almost like you're watching a movie uh, where you really try to understand uh, what is coming out of my mouth as opposed to what's written on the slide necessarily. So slides are essentially cues for uh, what is going to be uh, described. Uh, I mean, you can take notes, of course, but uh, try, uh, don't get derailed by just taking notes. We're going to put all the slides online. All the videos are clearly online. Uh, just take maybe simple notes that are not necessarily uh, that you find really uh, important. So in the end, everything is online. Uh, you don't need to uh, be, be taking notes. If you're a note taker, if you learn by the, uh, that way, of course, I'm not going to say you don't take notes, but uh, beware that uh, uh, we'll, we'll go at high bandwidth. Okay, so let's start with what will we learn in this course. Uh, essentially, the answer to this is hopefully we're going to learn how computers work from the ground up, uh, from the very basics, essentially. And also, we're going to learn why we care. I'm going to focus on why we care today. Uh, and uh, I guess, why do we learn uh, that? Well, I guess if you ask that, uh, then there are multiple answers because you're going to be computer scientists and engineers. And I think it's critical for people to learn uh, how computers work as opposed to uh, not know how computers work. Uh, I see a lot of uh, unfortunate cases where people just do programming without knowing exactly how those programs get executed in a computer. Uh, and I think uh, this is a bit sad, in my opinion, because in the end, it's not magic, right? In the end, uh, there is nice infrastructure that enables us to execute this. 
if you actually understand that infrastructure, you can achieve a whole lot more. Even if you end up becoming a programmer uh, that is relatively uh, far away from hardware. And hopefully I will convince you uh, in this uh, particular lecture. So why do we have computers? I will rephrase this as why do we do computing? Uh, and the answer to this is to solve problems in the end. So why do we solve problems? Uh, so that we can gain insight into the problems we're having, right? And I would fo uh, recommend folks to look at Richard Hamming's, this beautiful pay, uh, book that talks about uh, how computers are designed uh, for insight. Uh, the goal is really not to generate numbers, but actually to generate insight that can help solve the problems. Okay. And uh, of course, why do we need this? To enable a better life and future, hopefully, right? That's the goal in the end. Of course, technology is agnostic uh, to uh, betterness, let's say, or betterment. Uh, technology can be used for good or bad, but hopefully we'll stay positive in this course and uh, we'll try to make technology for the good uh, in the, into the future. Okay, so then the next question is, of course, how does a computer solve problems? And that's what, what we're going to focus on in this course. And the high level answer is by orchestrating electrons, at least in today's dominant technologies, computers orchestrate electrons and enable electrons to do the things that uh, will lead to the solutions of the problems. Okay, so how do problems get solved by electrons? That leads us to the transformation hierarchy uh, over here, which is uh, basically we start with a problem and we need uh, electrons to solve this problem. Clearly, we cannot speak electron language. At least so far, we have not figured out how to speak that electron language uh, very well as humans. So we have abstraction layers built into it. We translate the problem to an algorithm. Algorithm gets written uh, in an implementation in a programming language. And then that uh, gets executed on top of some system software. And that also gets translated into the software hardware interface, which are the instructions. And then that gets implemented uh, the instructions get implemented in uh, microarchitecture, as we will discuss a lot. And th those get implemented on, in the logic gates. And then those get implemented by the transistors and different kinds of devices, capacitors, for example, which operate based on the principles of physics and electrons in the end. So this is the transformation hierarchy. And this is where computer architecture sits in that transformation hierarchy. It's really the hardware software interface and the implementation of it, microarchitecture. But this is a very narrow view. And I will hopefully convince you in this lecture that it's a narrow view. We're going to focus on this expanded view of computer architecture going forward. But of course, this course is limited. Even though we're going to focus on the expanded view, we're going to spend a lot of time in the software hardware interface and the microarchitecture. So expanded view is really about algorithms uh, to devices. I'm going to give you examples of this from today's designs. OK, so levels of transformation. Let me go into a little bit more of this. I'm not going to uh, go into a lot of detail. Your, your books, actually, the recommended books cover the levels of transformation, especially Pat and Patel book. As I mentioned, the purpose of computing is to gain insight. And this is Richard Hamming with his cat, as you can see over there. And we gain and generate insight by solving problems. Uh, the key question is, how do we ensure problems are solved by electrons? Essentially, that brings us to transformation hierarchy. So let me go into a little bit more into the transformation hierarchy. Problem gets translated to an algorithm. An algorithm is something that's essential for, uh, to, for being executed on a computer. It's really a step-by-step -step definition of a procedure uh, that has three properties. Essentially, it, is a, it has a property of finiteness, which means that it's guaranteed to terminate. Each step is precisely stated. This is definiteness. And each step can be carried out by a computer, effective computability, right? Uh, so there, there are steps that cannot be carried out by a computer, for example. I don't know. Uh, you can imagine uh, expressing steps that way. Uh, and uh, those should not be part of the algorithm definition, uh, clearly. Uh, OK. Uh, again, there could be many algorithms that have these characteristics to solve the same problem. Uh, for example, if I'm a human, a human is a computer, let's say, and I want to go from here uh, to uh, Stadelhofen station, uh, to be able to do that, uh, I have an algorithm, right? And the algorithm can try to minimize the distance from here to there. It can minimize the uh, time from here to there. Uh, and it needs to uh, be uh, ending. It needs to be definite step by step computable by me. Uh, and it also needs to effectively computable each step. For example, if, if one of the steps involves uh, going from here to Stadelhof and I have to jump over uh, a building, that's not going to work, right? Because I, I am not uh, capable of executing that step as being a computer. Right? So that's an example of effective computability. 
Okay, next is programming and language. There are many, many languages. We're not going to cover that in this lecture, but you're taking other courses. And then runtime system and then ISA. Let's focus on the ISA a little bit because we're going to spend a lot of time on it, especially early on. ISA is the instruction set architecture. This is really the interface or contract between software and hardware. This is what the programmer assumes hardware will satisfy. So this contract will specify a lot of things, including what the instructions will do. And we're going to focus on that a lot, as I said. Microarchitecture, we're going to focus on this a lot also. This is really one implementation of the ISA. So today, for example, we have the x86 ISA, ARM ISA, and MIPS ISA, and many other ISAs. RISC V is another ISA, for example. It's an open ISA. Microarchitecture is an implementation of the ISA that satisfies the contract. There may be many, many implementations of the ISA, as we will see in this course. Some of the implementations underneath basically do things that the ISA doesn't uh, talk about, but uh, the implementations don't expose that to the program. So they still satisfy the contract, but they do very, very interesting things like out of order execution of instructions so that they can actually maximize the performance of systems. Okay, and that microarchitecture gets implemented in logic gates and logic structures. This is essentially what we will also talk about. We'll start with actually, these are digital logic circuits. These are building blocks of the microarchitecture like gates. And then they're built based on transistors like devices. So in this course, we're gonna focus a lot on the logic microarchitecture ISA and touch upon programs, runtime systems a little bit, algorithms also. But main focus will be the, uh, the box over here as you see. But we will start with a transistor as, um, um, uh, as an abstraction. We will abstract it as a light switch, uh, for example. Uh, and then build logic gates on top of that and Boolean algebra on top of that. Okay, so hopefully this gives you an overview. So what is computer architecture uh, given this? So the way I like to think about computer architecture is it's really the science and art of designing computing platforms. Uh, and that's it, that's a general definition, right? Uh, and this includes the hardware. This includes the interface, hardware software interface. This includes the system software in my opinion and the programming model. So this is an expanded definition as you can see. And it's also, it's not just science in my opinion, it's also an art because uh, these computers are going to be running workloads that we don't know of. Uh, they're going to be out there maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 years, who knows? So they could be executing things that we have no idea uh, they would be executing when we're designing them. A design of a computer takes anywhere between six months to let's say five, six, seven, eight years. And uh, you take that time to design, but the computer will be operating in the field for 40 years, let's say. And it may, it may operate, right? My cell phone is six years old, for example. So how do you make it a science? Well, it's very difficult. If you want to really truly make it a science, you have to be able to model into the future 40 years, let's say, or even five years, or even one year. Who can model into the future for one year and figure out what workloads will be executed on this device? So you really need to make decisions based on art and experience as well, in addition to science. That's why this is really a combination of science and art. I think that's true for a lot of engineering fields, but more so in fields that are relatively fast moving where you don't know what's going to happen into the future. And of course, the goal of designing this computing platform is could be multiple. Uh, and these are called design goals. Uh, basically, we design these systems to achieve a set of design goals. And design goals depend on what kind of system you're designing. For example, one design goal could be, I would like to achieve the highest performance on Earth on workloads X, Y, Z. So this could be the very high performance computing systems, right? Supercomputers, for example. Uh, and then another design goal could be, I'd like to achieve the longest battery life at a form factor that fits in your pocket with cost less than some number of Swiss francs or whatever your favorite currency is. Now, this sounds like a mobile system, but a very different design point than uh, the supercomputer, right? Supercomputer doesn't have to fit in your pocket, for example. So it has very different thermal and energy and power and cooling requirements compared to uh, your cell phone, let's say. Another example is, I would like to get the best average performance across all known workloads or all workloads that I care about at the best performance divided by cost ratio. And again, this is uh, what's called general purpose computing in general. Uh, so this, this is where Intel and AMD, for example, design systems that are general purpose. Uh, and this is a very different uh, cost and design point uh, compared to the previous two. And you can keep expanding it. For example, you can say, I care about only one workload, but I don't want to uh, have a supercomputer. I want to have a relatively specialized system, uh, and we're going uh, to uh, we're going to talk about those actually in this particular lecture also. So there may be many, many, many different computing platforms that you design. For example, I want to have the best AI ML inference engine accelerator uh, that operates uh, with mobile computing constraints, right? And that's going to be important, increasingly important going into the future, and that's happening today. 
And that's another design point uh, for a computing platform. And usually you have different metrics. We will talk about those metrics, especially in the next lecture. Maybe today we will not go into that. And usually you evaluate designs based on metrics. And there are many, many metrics you evaluate designs with. Uh, you can actually come up with tens, twenties of metrics, but sometimes some of these metrics are more important. Some of these metrics are more important than some other metrics. So it's important to keep in mind that this is really about design and trade-offs, and uh, the course will focus on the design and trade-offs. But in the end, designing a supercomputer may be completely different from designing a smartphone, but many, many fundamental principles, trade-offs, and decision-making are actually similar. And that's where hopefully this course will be very useful to you and I will give you that perspective. In the end, the fundamental building blocks are quite similar and the trade-offs you make may be different, but the trade-off space you're dealing with is going to be very similar. Okay, so I will uh, leave it at that and give you some examples of different computing platforms. Let's just show you some examples. These are some things that you may have, uh, you may be used to. Some of them are old, clearly. Uh, these are some other computing platforms, right? They're used for different purposes. Clearly, the design point is very different. This is another computing platform. This is clearly a self-driving car. Well, kind of. Uh, and it's a, it's a joke from Mr. Bean, of course. But it's, uh, it's, it, it raises a lot of questions, actually. This is really a computing platform in the end. And do you really trust your self-driving car this much to be able to sit on it comfortably and do what Mr. Bean is doing over here? I would argue that we are not at that point in computing today. So our design points do not really fully enable this sort of self-driving today. And we're going to talk about that uh, in this lecture and in some other lectures as well. Not necessarily directly, but the design decisions we make are going to affect uh, things like self-driving cars and how much we can trust them, for example. OK, this is another example that I just wanted to show. This, this is one of older, Google, uh, older one of the Google's self-driving cars. You can see the computing infrastructure in the back so that the self-driving car can do vision processing, machine learning, et cetera, so that it doesn't hit a pedestrian, for example, and it can stay on the road. For this is another computing platform. This is a data center. It's more general purpose. It can execute many things, but clearly you can see that uh, the, the, the form factor of this is very different from what we have seen earlier. This is another one that looks kind of similar to the data center, but it's actually very different. This is a supercomputer. This was one of the fastest supercomputers, Tianhe 2. I don't think it's the fastest anymore. Uh, uh, but I like this picture, kind of. It looks similar to the previous one. This is really designed for high-performance scientific calculations, best performance in the world. OK, this is another example. This is a machine learning accelerator that was designed by Google. It's called TPU, Tensor Processing Unit. This is the first version of it. And uh, we are going to cover the fundamental principles that this particular machine learning accelerator is based on when we cover the systolic arrays lecture. It's essentially a systolic array-based processor. You will see that later on in this course. and. Uh, the, the whole purpose of this is really to accelerate inference uh, in machine learning. Basically, train a model, and then that model basically predicts or classifies some images, let's say. It doesn't have to be images, but it could be any input that you give to it. And that classification task is intensive in terms of uh, uh, multiply and accumulate operations, for example. And those classification tasks can be uh, uh, performed much faster using the specialized systolic array engine uh, that essentially pumps data in and pumps outputs out over here and does multiplication inside this array while the data is flowing. And we will cover the fundamental principles of this, but I wanted to give you this as an example of um, today's computing platforms uh, that are specialized for machine learning. This is really specialized for machine learning. And this is one example also of the algorithm architecture device co-design that I mentioned, cutting across these layers uh, as opposed to uh, just looking at the hardware software interface and the microarchitecture. This is really, you design the algorithm such that it can execute nicely on this systolic array, for example. Okay, I'm going to go into more details when we talk about systolic arrays. I'm going to show this picture actually later in this lecture as well. So this is another example, Tesla, a car company actually, uh, designed these chips so that they can do specialized uh, vision processing and machine learning on their self-driving cars. And they decided to design their chips because it was important for them so that they could actually customize the chip to the workloads that are running on their system. So imagine this is a car company designing chips, right? That doesn't go well necessarily, but it does go well because they have to customize. The, the computing requirements of the workloads that they're running uh, are so intense that they have to customize the hardware to the algorithms that they're deploying in the field. And they actually add other features like better uh, two multiple chips operating together so that they can have better redundancy, better safety. And you can see some of the numbers over here 
uh, if I go back to Google, Google essentially made the same choice. They basically said, okay, we have these workloads that are intensively executing machine learning inference in our data centers. They're consuming a lot of energy and they're slow on existing systems. How do, I, how do we actually accelerate them? And they decided the right answer or the cost-effective answer and high performance and energy efficient answer for them was to actually design their own chips that are customized for those workloads. So this is what I mean by algorithm architecture, device co-design, customization across the stack. And this is happening in many, many domains, as you can see. Traditionally, software companies are becoming hardware software co-design companies. Traditionally, car makers are becoming hardware software co-design companies plus car makers, as you can see. So I'm going to show you more examples of this. But this is my axiom uh, going forward. Essentially, if you would like to achieve the highest energy efficiency and performance, as well as reliability, let's say security, some other metrics, but let's start with energy efficiency and performance. If you would like to do that, we really must, must take the expanded view of computer architecture and co-design across the stack uh, hierarchy, algorithms to devices. And this enables us to specialize the system, overall system, as much as possible within the design goals so that we can achieve the design goals. So hopefully I'll give you some more examples of this. So with that in mind, uh, let me talk a little bit more about why studying computer architecture is exciting. And I'm gonna give you some examples in this lecture of what's happening today in computer architecture and cutting edge. So in a sense, uh, uh, if you're worried about the exam in this lecture, relax, because this lecture is really going to be motivation uh, for, for all of you. Uh, I don't think any questions will really come up on the exam related to this particular lecture. But I think it's really important for you to understand for the rest of uh, this course, as well as uh, your careers and hopefully your life, uh, I would like to think of it that way. But computer architecture is, this is another definition. It's really the science and art of designing, selecting, and interconnecting hardware components and designing the hardware software interface to create a computing system that meets functional performance, energy consumption, cost, and other specific goals. Okay, why do we want to do this? And hopefully I showed you earlier, but we would like to enable better systems. Uh, and if you want to enable better systems and better life, you want to make computers faster, cheaper, smaller, more reliable, more secure, more robust, et cetera, uh, so that we can solve big problems, right? Uh, and I will actually point you to some other lecture uh, as an optional assignment where you can get extra credit for uh, when we talk about uh, uh, enabling better systems. So we would like to exploit advanced and changes in underlying technology and circuits. On top of that, we would like to enable new applications. For example, uh, computer architecture actually has enabled new applications like machine learning. The reason why machine learning is extremely successful today is because GPUs were able to train uh, algorithms that were developed decades ago. And when GPUs became successful parallel computers that are general purpose, GPUs are graphics processing units that everybody's using today on their cell phone or laptop, for example. When they became successful parallel computers, uh, other folks who are doing machine learning said, okay, maybe we can use this to train our algorithms, train our models. Maybe we can use them to do inference. And uh, they basically essentially did that. And because of that, the machine learning revolution is really taking place today. Uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning revolution. So there are other examples of this, like self-driving cars clearly relies on vision, machine learning, et cetera. But it came across, it came about because of, again, the processing power provided by computer architecture and lifelike 3D visualization 20 years ago, virtual reality, those are interesting things, again, that require very intense computations that are extremely energy efficient, potentially, depending on what you do with the virtual reality, right? If I have a headset, virtual reality headset, I don't want my head to burn while uh, this headset is doing accurate computations, right? And then personalized genomics and personalized medicine, which we are hopefully going to talk about toward the end of this lecture, is another new application that I believe is actually extremely promising and extremely data intensive. So the, the list goes on actually. Uh, the list was a little bit less out, updated. For example, video. Even video is an application, but today we take it for granted, right? But if you go back 40 years ago, the computer architectures at the time were not fast enough to do good video. But today we can do much, much better video like the Zoom streaming. So our infrastructure in computer architecture has developed a lot to enable these applications. And some of the applications we're taking for granted. Maybe 40 years later, we're going to take self-driving cars for granted also. And that will be because of this uh, computer architecture advances as well as the hardware software co-design that I mentioned uh, so far. OK, uh, on top of this, we would like to enable better uh, solutions to problems. Software innovation is actually built on trends and changes in computer architecture, as I mentioned, the machine learning revolution. 
for example. And over time, more than 50% performance improvement per year has enabled an innovation. This is, this is a uh, number from general purpose computing. But for special purpose computing, this number can be much, much higher, actually. Like orders of magnitude improvements are actually possible if you're specialized or specializing your system to a particular application. And finally, we would like to study computer architecture so that we can understand why computers work the way they do, right? So that we can fix them uh, whenever they're not working or we can make them better, right? And I think this is, this is actually a very, very scientific part of it because if it already exists and if you're trying to understand it, you can apply, uh, essentially apply all of the scientific principles uh, completely without actually resorting to a lot to art over here. Okay, so today is actually a very exciting time to study computer architecture because industry is in a large paradigm shift to novel architectures. There are many different potential system designs possible. And when I say industries, it's actually the innovation industry in general. It's not just the chip industry, for example. It's not just the software industry. It's really the innovation industry. So a lot of, for example, Tesla has nothing to do with software or chips, right? But uh, they're actually designing novel architectures so that they can, they can improve their system designs, right? And, and this shift is really motivated by, motivated by many difficult problems. And uh, also it's caused by the shift as well. So we have many difficult problems motivating the shift. We have many difficult problems caused by the shift at the same time. So we would like to solve all of those problems. And I'll give you, I, I've, I've written some examples over here. I'm not going to talk about all of these. I'm going to give you some examples uh, in these lectures that you, you will see. But clearly we have a huge hunger for data and new data intensive applications, hopefully for the good. Uh, we have significant constraints like power, energy, and thermals, depending on the design constraints. Designs are becoming very complex. Technology is becoming not so good in scaling as we will discuss. We have big memory and data bottlenecks. We have reliability problems. We have programming issues. We have huge security and privacy issues actually in computation today, both general purpose and special purpose. And there are today no clear and definitive answers to these problems. As a result, people are actually exploit exploring new paradigms uh, and new novel architectures to solve these problems. And actually today, computing landscape is very different from what it was 10 to 20 years ago. I, I actually took my first computer architecture course, just like you're doing in my bachelor's, uh, second semester actually, uh, at, at the University of Michigan from uh, a person who would become my PhD advisor later on, Yale Pat. And that was in 1998, that's 23 years ago, right? And when I was taking that course, the computing landscape was extremely different than what it's today. So today is much more exciting, let's say. I was always excited clearly about computer architecture, but today uh, computer architecture is everywhere. We are basically changing the systems. At the time I was studying, uh, we were focused on essentially single core processors, simple single core processors, that, can, uh, that are optimized for doing one thread execution really, really well, high performance. Even energy efficiency was not that important at the time. We're talking about 1998, right? So over time, uh, over the course of like 23 years, things have changed a lot. And I'm going to show you some examples. Today, both applications and technology demand novel architectures and architectures and designs are actually responding to them. Basically today, every component and its interfaces, as well as entire system designs are being re-examined. And I hope to show you some examples of this. And these are some components. I, I've given you some examples, like we have heterogeneous processors and accelerators, many, many processors and accelerators. We have hybrid memories, hybrid storage, persistent memory and storage, GPUs, AI and ML accelerators. So some of the things actually don't exist in this picture clearly, but they exist in architecture. So today we are at a very, very interesting place. And I think the axiom I mentioned earlier, I'm not going to repeat it, but basically we really need to understand the importance of this axiom. We really need to take an expanded view because that's what's going to enable the next generation of revolutions in systems. Let me give you a historical perspective also. This, I think uh, this is going to be a little bit philosophical, but I think it's important for uh, uh, freshman students to be exposed to uh, these bigger concepts in life, let's say. Uh, so many people probably know about Richard Feynman. Uh, he is a famous American physicist. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize at some point in his life. But basically, he's known for many things, uh, uh, especially for uh, his uh, passion for teaching. I think that's very important. But he's also known for this phrase that's called, there's plenty of room at the bottom. And what he meant when he said this in 1959 was that essentially uh, devices and circuits mostly devices actually, present a huge opportunity for us to improve and innovate the systems that we're designing. He actually mentioned, for example, direct manipulation of individual atoms using devices so that you can have synthetic chemistry that's much powerful. Uh, and then later, actually, 
uh, this talk was relatively unnoticed, let's say. You can see the Wikipedia over here. Nanotechnology advocates, who are actually quite successful today because nanotechnology is everywhere today in design, uh, they basically use this talk to establish the scientific credibility of their work. But other things that uh, Feynman imagined in this talk was uh, basically denser computer circuitry. Uh, clearly, this is 1959, right? This is actually before Moore, uh, Gordon Moore, uh, mentioned his law that was 1965, as we will discuss in the later lectures. He basically suggested it should be possible in principle to make nanoscale machines that arrange the atoms in the way we want and do a chemical synthesis by mechanical manipulation. And he also presented this idea that I like, which is basically essentially a surgical robot, right? Uh, swallowing the doctor, he said over here. Uh, so these are basically things he thought would be enabled by extreme innovations at the lower level of the stack. Devices and circuits. Remember the transformation hierarchy? This is devices and circuits. And I actually believe that there's a lot of opportunity still uh, at this lower level of the stack. We just need to find it. It's becoming harder to find that opportunity, but we need to find it. So devices and circuits still present huge opportunities, in my opinion. And I'm going to justify it in a little bit as well. So clearly, if people are exploring actually graphene based circuits today, for example, uh, there are other uh, circuits that people are exploring. Quantum is one example. I believe those are all going to be part of the equation into the future. But there's also another perspective, which is uh, there's plenty of room at the top. This was written more recently. This is actually a, a, a consensus view of almost, let's say, uh, that most people are thinking that uh, as technology scaling becomes difficult at the circuit and device level, we should explore more at the software algorithms and hardware architecture layers, basically. Basically, opportunities for growth in computing performance is going to be available and be, be even more important at the higher levels of the stack. So why am I telling you all this? I think uh, I don't subscribe to either of these, basically. I think uh, I would revisit my axiom saying that I actually believe that there's plenty of room both at the top and the bottom. We need to investigate it and need to find it. But we can actually do much, much more than we could do individually at the top and the bottom when you can actually communicate well between and optimize across the top and the bottom. So it's really about algorithms to devices at the bottom. You can optimize them both, but you can get much more by communicating between them more and optimizing across the stack. I'm going to give you some more examples of this. So that's why we have this expanded view. And hopefully, I've, uh, I've given you the historical perspective of this expanded uh, view as well. OK, so now let's jump into the things that I believe are exciting that are happening in computer architecture today. Uh, and I'll give you a sampling of what I believe is happening, uh, including something that has happened just last week. So you're going to be really, cutting, really at the cutting edge uh, by listening to what comes. Uh, but I'm not going to start with that. So I'm going to basically first talk about issues that are uh, the interesting things that are happening related to performance and energy efficiency. And this is one example from 2019. So if you took this course before 2019, you wouldn't have seen it. And this is uh, called non-volatile memory. It's based on Intel's 3D X-point, cross-point technology. You can see that this is very similar to your main memory DIMMs, right, modules. But except it's not DRAM. It's not dynamic random access memory. If you, uh, well, you probably know uh, that DRAM, dynamic random access memory, when you power your computer off, it loses uh, the data. As a result, uh, you have to uh, have a hard disk, for example, that's slow, or SSD that's slow to back up your critical data. This one, this thing over here, replaces DRAM potentially, but it doesn't lose its data on a power loss. So it sounds great, right? This is non-volatile memory, essentially, main memory. Its speeds are comparable to DRAM. Today, it's not as close, but it's much closer to DRAM compared to, its, uh, compared to flash memory, for example. So it's actually uh, competitive, competing with DRAM today. So this was not around in two, until 2019. Now it can enable a lot of innovation, right? This, is, this, this clearly was enabled by a lot of innovation at the device level. So this is based on some technology called phase change memory. It's fundamentally different from dynamic random access memory. We're going to talk about that later on. Uh, and uh, this technology required a lot of work to make it work, essentially. And that took more than 10 years or so uh, for many, many companies to work on it. Intel was the first one to release it uh, to the public. As you can see, you can buy it actually online and put it uh, in your systems, as assuming that they're capable of uh, using this, of course. So this can enable a lot of innovation, operating systems, applications. For example, I mean, one very simple example could be very fast hibernate, right? You don't need to actually, your, your DRAM, you don't lose data when you turn off your DRAM in this case, assuming this is your main memory. So I think this is very exciting. Uh, and uh, just to give you an idea, uh, idea of how long it takes to get to these innovations, clearly there are no innovations at the device level. 
There are innovations at the architecture level also. So we actually did some work on this topic. We're actually doing some work on this topic still, but uh, we did some very preliminary early work in the area. This was published in ISCA, the major computer architecture conference in 2019. We were looking at this topic in 2007. And basically we were actually uh, exploring the idea of can we replace dynamic random access memory with phase change memory. And we were doing these studies 12 years before Intel actually released their chip. So we were actually imagining the future as architects and trying to replace uh, it with a better future, let's say. But this also gives you an idea that you may have a great idea potentially, but that idea may not be realized for decades. In this case, we're actually lucky. It's only 12 years, let's say, from concept to realization, let's say. And this is another paper. If you're interested in reading it, this is a easier to read paper, let's say, that talks about phase change memory technology, at least the, our perspective of uh, it's when we developed it at the time. Okay, so, okay, let's move from memory to something else. This is another example that's happening today. This is again announced in 2019. Uh, let me look at the, uh, something on the right side. Right side is the largest GPU comparison, right? Uh, GPU clearly has been around for a long time. GPUs are old right now. I cannot talk about GPUs anymore as something new, but these are some of the very capable computation engines, right? GPUs, 21.1 billion transistors, NVIDIA Titan GPU, right? Uh, Titan 5, and it's big, 815 square millimeters. Well, these folks at Cerebras designed uh, a chip and a machine that's much bigger. The chip itself, you can see that it's 46,000 square millimeters. It's a wafer scale engine. So normally you start with wafers, you cut it into pieces and those pieces become your chips. These folks said, no, we actually want a chip that's much more capable. We want to accelerate these machine learning training workloads so that we can form the model. And we want a lot of computation capability, multiply and accumulates that are very close to huge amounts of memory. How do we get that? Well, let's make the wafer the chip. And that wafer now has a lot of computation elements as well as a lot of memory next to it. I believe, don't quote me on it, but I think they have 18 gigabytes of SRAM that's really very close to the computation units over here. So this, you can think of this as a near data processing engine, but basically that was their purpose. And then they specialize a system so that they can execute machine learning workloads. They have a algorithm, a compiler, programming language, et cetera flow so that they can compile these machine learning training and inference workloads they, such that they can execute it on their chips. So it's a full system design, uh, which is very similar to what we've discussed earlier. So clearly there are a lot of challenges to this. It's a startup, it's not been successful yet, but they've actually released platforms that are potentially being used by uh, some big players. Uh, we don't know who they are necessarily. It could be the governments, for, for example, that could be building models. Not necessarily for the good, by the way, but again, technology is agnostic. Uh, uh, but essentially, this system needs to have very high power requirements, for example. How do you cool this huge wafer uh, that you can hold in your hand, right? Uh, how do you actually uh, power up that huge wafer? How do you ensure that it operates reliably? Whenever you have a fault in any part of this chip, how do you ensure that that fault doesn't affect the whole system? Because the probability of a fault in a given chip now increases because chip is the entire wafer, right? So there are a lot of issues that span the system stack. But this is happening today. It was not easy to imagine that this would happen 10 years ago. Well, I think if you're, if you're a computer architect and looking forward, yes, you could imagine it. But uh, for the regular folk, let's say, it's not easy to imagine. So by the way, I should go back over here to phase change memory. This also has an algorithm uh, uh, architecture co-design. You need to design the system to take advantage of this non-volatility and persistence, actually. I did not go into it, but uh, I'm happy to talk about it later on. Uh, clearly, this is kind of outside the focus of this course, but if you're interested, you can read these articles, for example. But these are both algorithm architecture device co-designs. So another example, this was actually also developed in 2019. This is processing in DRAM engine. Normal computers, as we will see in this course, uh, are actually uh, bringing data from memory to the processor so that the processor can process it. These folks at UpMem basically enabled a paradigm called processing in DRAM in memory. And basically they put processors inside the memory chip simple processors. And they're not extremely capable because you cannot, uh, fundamentally, uh, the process technologies that you use to design memory chips, main memory chips, and processors are actually not as compatible. So these folks actually did that. Now you can actually uh, do the processing next to the data without moving the data outside the DRAM chip. Now this is great because moving the data outside the DRAM chip actually costs a lot of energy and a lot of performance. So you can gain a lot of performance energy back by minimizing the data movement. So this is actually very fascinating in my opinion. 
And this is happening today. We actually have access to these chips. We actually have experimented with them. We actually see a lot of benefits and we actually are uh, going to publish a paper soon related to this. And uh, at some point, if you take the advanced course, you will actually learn a lot more about this. But this was not imaginable 10 years ago also. I mean, even myself who has worked on processing in memory, for example, did not think that this would be coming as fast as it has come uh, because of the resistance uh, sometimes that you see to new ideas, uh, as we will see. Okay, now let's go to something that has happened last week. Uh, this is also in the processing in memory space. And you can see that this is press release by Samsung, which is clearly the major uh, uh, memory company. There are three major memory companies. Samsung is the one that has the highest market share, let's say. And these folks basically said they have developed a new processing in memory architecture that is specialized for machine learning applications, let's say. And they basically claim that they can reduce the energy consumption by more than 70%, as you can see. So this is actually very exciting, in my opinion. And you're lucky that this course started one week after the ISSCC conference where this was announced. And you can see, again, I don't expect you to understand all of this clearly. We're going to start from the basics later on, uh, like not in the next lecture, but next week. Uh, so hopefully we'll build up to these. But just to give you an idea of the complexity of the systems today, these, this is based on something called high bandwidth memory. And you can see that they're stacking. They're really stacking layers of chips. Uh, and uh, you can see that there are some memory layers over here, and there are some uh, compute layers, like FIMDRAM layers. So there, there are some compute-capable memory layers that they have. And you can see that, I'm not going to go into the terminology, you can read the paper or look at the presentation, but these compute uh, processors inside the DRAM chip, uh, DRAM layer, uh, inside the me uh, memory layers over here, can do floating point multiplication, accumulation, addition, and multiply and accumulate, as you can see, which are heavily used by machine learning workloads. Clearly, you can use this for other workloads as well, right? That can benefit from this. But clearly, this is designed with machine learning in mind so that you can accelerate those workloads because that's the workload that's uh, really experiencing huge bottlenecks in terms of both energy and performance today. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, let, let's, uh, let me give you some more examples over here somehow. Okay. Okay, I don't know what's happening. Uh, okay, so this is another example. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but you can see that uh, this is a diagram from the paper that they published a week ago. You can see that some of the principles that we're going to see in this lecture are actually employed in this processing in memory engine. So this is what I meant by fundamental principles uh, that we're going to cover. So uh, you're going to see how a pipeline operates how uh, their register files, how you can control them, how you can sequence through instructions. You can do that on the processing side. You can do that on the memory side over here. So you can see that the fundamentals you're going to learn in this course are going to be applicable to different places in the computation, uh, different places in the platforms. And function memory, even though it's a new concept, it's taking advantage of some of the fundamental building blocks to enable computation next to memory. And we're going to talk about instruction sets, for example. This particular processor that they have next to memory has an instruction set. We're going to see a much bigger instruction set, but they have a subset of these instructions over here, uh, as you can see. Uh, so hopefully, uh, this gives you an idea. And this is the real chip implementation that they showed uh, last week. Uh, you can see that there's digital register transfer level language, which you're going to be exposed to in this course a lot. You're going to do the labs in register transfer level language. We're going to talk all about that. We're going to talk about course logistics, and we're going to talk about what we're going to cover we're going to, in the labs and lectures, but they're going to happen next week. This, this first week is all about motivation so that you can understand the importance of what's coming. And also, you can get acquainted with the cutting edge that's happening in the field so that uh, you can see what kind of revolutions might be happening across the stack. Okay, uh, but they, they basically put a lot of work into designing the register transfer level and synthesizing it, but they also do a lot of full custom design, meaning that they place and route some of the uh, transistors but with using their hands over here. And you can see the layout of the chip over here. I'm not going to talk about. Okay, but again, this is not a new idea, actually. The earliest processing in memory paper comes from 1970. Granted, it's a bit different from this because technology was different, but we have actually been working on processing in memory actively for the last 10 years or so. This is one of the papers that actually, I believe in, is, conceptually similar to what the previous two, pay, two works, UpMem and uh, Samsung has introduced. And we looked at specialized processing in memory using graph processing as a specialized workload and showed significant benefits uh, on that. And I believe this is important. Uh, we've been looking at simple processing in memory approaches also so that you can simplify it. 
We've been looking at, uh, together with Google, we looked at processing in memory on mobile devices. I'm going to actually get back to this work and give you some data points later on. It should be hopefully interesting. We've been also looking at NDRM processing. You can see the papers related to this. This is also, I think, going to be more important going into the future. It has a slightly different approach, uh, but hopefully you can see it uh, later on. Again, I don't expect you to know or read any of these papers. This is just to give you an idea that what's happening in research is actually affecting products. And uh, that enables us to teach that as fundamentals going into the future, because you're going to be potentially programming for these in-memory computing engines, even if you end up becoming a programmer, let's say software engineer, uh, and you don't want to deal with any of the systems, platforms, hardware, uh, devices, circuits issues, you may still be programming for these things, right? Uh, okay, and then the research is still happening actually. Uh, in the next month at the ASPOS conference, we're going to talk about bit serial SIMD processing and DRAM and a framework uh, programming as well as uh, enabling framework for this. And then next week in the HPCA, High Performance Computer Architecture Conference, we're going to talk about synchronization for near data processing architecture. So this is just to give you an idea of there are a lot of issues to be solved at the architectural level for these new systems. And if you're really, really interested, I would recommend looking into this uh, long paper. Uh, hopefully, it's a tutorial paper that was uh, written by me and my postdocs uh, in December uh, to give you an idea. And uh, there's also tutorials related to this that I delivered. And this is the most up-to-date tutorial, let's say, that was uh, uh, invited at the IEDM. IEDM is the International Electron Devices Meeting this year, or last year, last December. It had the 66th incarnation of it. And it's the cutting edge conference in, electron, in, in devices. Uh, uh, and uh, essentially, if you're interested, this covers a lot of the state of the art in processing in memory. It clearly doesn't have the Samsung uh, uh, announcement because that happened in February, not December, right? Okay, and again, this is just a foreshadowing. We cover, we're not gonna focus a lot on processing in memory and these really, really new paradigms in this course because this course is an introductory course, but I have to inform you of what's coming next because this is going to happen hopefully. Uh, well, it's happening as you can see, uh, but if you're really interested in this, you can take the next course after this course, which is the computer architecture course as the master's level. And we have a lot of material related to processing in memory on that, including the upman processing in memory engine. Okay, so let me go back. There are other things that are happening. I mentioned this, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Clearly people are designing AI and machine learning accelerators. Tesla, a car company is designing vision processors, machine learning accelerators so that they can employ it in their systems, customize for the software. They can customize the software and the hardware together so that they can make the right decisions in their self-driving cars safely, right? Well, hopefully this is improving their systems, right? Instead of trusting some other manufacturer to design the chips that uh, do not necessarily uh, go well with the software that they design, right? That's exactly why they're designing their own chips so that these chips can do exactly what they want at the software level. They can be energy efficient and they can actually be safe and secure and they can be optimized for the vision processing and machine learning applications that are really critical for uh, essentially enabling a self-driving car to see, right? To see and take action, right? Okay, so I'm not going to talk about this. If you're really interested, again, there's a YouTube video that I linked over here. It's actually a beautiful video. It's actually part of the conference, I think, uh, that Tesla organized at some point in 2019. Uh, and their chief architect uh, talks about the design of these systems. There are also a lot of software related talks if you're interested in those. So this is Google's TPU generation one. I mentioned that this actually relatively early, earlier than uh, the uh, Tesla's chip. And again, a company like Google, a traditionally software company is investing in these chips because they find this is much better for their system. In fact, they invested a lot more. This is TPU generation two. TPU generation one can do inference classification, but it cannot train these large machine learning models. So this one can train these large machine learning models. As a result, it, it requires a lot more computation capability as you can see over here. It has high bandwidth memory, which Samsung chip is based on as opposed to less lower bandwidth memory. So it has a lot more chips. As you can see, this is designed for much more powerful uh, computation and uh, applications that can strain the computation much more. You can see the, also uh, the sinks, right? The heat sinks over here. It's, uh, it's, uh, so it's a beast, let's say. And this is just generation two. There are generation three and generation four that we don't necessarily know of. And fundamentally, at the heart of it, this is a systolic array. Systolic arrays were developed in the late 1970s. Uh, and they were developed for image processing, actually. Uh, well, image processing was an application for it, let's say. They were developed for convolutions. So today, they're actually very good at 
uh, executing convolutional neural networks, which they, which what, which is what they, what they were developed for. So in a sense, there's nothing new here. But what's really new is the application and the system design. So fundamental principles of systolic arrays are very, very similar to what they were when they were developed in 1970s, 1980s, as we will discuss in a later lecture. But how we actually make, take advantage of them, how we actually customize them, how we actually make them work in a real system, and this is an example, uh, is important today. So you can see a little bit more detail over here. This is the matrix multiplication unit. You can do 64,000 matrix multiplication in one clock cycle, as you can see over here in this uh, tensor processing unit. Uh, and a lot of the uh, enabling factors are actually in the system software and platform over here. You can see that you need to ensure that weights, uh, to the weights of the net network get, weight, get fetched at the right time. The data that you're going to multiply with the weights are fetched at the right time. And everything is orchestrated such that this matrix multiplication happens nicely, right? And again, I'm not going to talk about this in detail. We're going to cover a little bit more when we talk about systolic arrays. We're going to start from the fundamental principles of systolic arrays. That's going to be around lecture 16 or so, I think. So just, just to give you an example, we're going to build up to uh, how these systolic arrays actually execute. OK, so there are many, many other AI ML chips. I'm not going to list them. But essentially, all big company and some many small companies and startups that you know of that is doing something related to AI and ML are developing their own chips. So I know for sure that, oh, well, actually they're published or they're actually written white papers on their chips, all of these companies over here. Clearly NVIDIA, right? They built GPUs, which enabled the machine learning revolution, but they also have specialized processing units for tensors uh, inside their GPUs as well. And this is one example. You can go, go to this link if you're interested. I mean, I haven't verified everything, but this looks, reasonable to look at, except I think uh, this is a bit older. This is about, about two years old now. Uh, and these folks, uh, I think the number of companies that are working on this have increased significantly going into the future. OK, so clearly AI and machine learning is a very hot application, uh, maybe somehow sometimes overblown in terms of importance. That's also true in my opinion. But clearly, it's important. No question about that. Maybe it's overblown in terms of its capabilities uh, going into the future. I think we still need to invest in uh, other paradigms uh, in terms of the capabilities, uh, but uh, these applications are driving innovation across the system stack. Okay, let me jump into reliability and security, a completely different perspective. And this is also becoming very interesting and very tough today also. Let me give you some examples. I mean, if this were a live lecture, I would ask how many people know about the DRAM hammer vulnerability. I will still ask, you can feel free to uh, write or raise your hands, but it's not unfortunately very interactive. We need to find some solution uh, for this interactivity. I guess nobody said they know about Rohammer, so I'm going to assume that they, oh, okay, I see some raised hands on some corner of my Zoom. Unfortunately, I don't see everything that you write. So if you are writing something, uh, then I cannot read it because I'm not very good at parallel processing, let's say, <laughs> because I have to be able to both speak as well as look at the, uh, what's written. And I see a lot of things written. So hopefully my TAs are handling that. But I, basically, I see that a lot of people are raising hands. But this is a new problem, relatively new problem. We actually discovered it around 2012 and 2013 together with Intel. Uh, and let me give you the story of it very quickly. We're going to talk a little bit more about it in the next lecture, actually. Basically, this is the phenomenon that you can predictably induce bit flips in commodity DRAM chips. Basically, you can change a 1 to a 0 or a 0 to a 1 predictably without having any permissions. So this should not happen, right? This sucks, actually. Nobody should be able to do this, right? And uh, if you can do this, that means that you can damage somebody else's system. That means that you can take over somebody else's system and become root and take all of their system and private data, et cetera. So this is not good. And when we actually discovered this, we said that more than 80% of the tested DRAM chips are vulnerable. We demonstrated experimentally and rigorously. And this is really the first example of how a simple hardware circuit level failure mechanism can create a widespread system security vulnerability. And as a result, people are actually developing a lot of attacks. So this is a popular magazine article in Wired magazine, you may be following this. It's actually, it is actually sometimes nice articles like this. Uh, but basically, this for, uh, Andy uh, says here that forget software. Now hackers are exploiting physics. And I think at a very, very high level, this is a very nice characterization of uh, what Rohammer is about. There is a physical problem at the circuit level that leads to these bit flips. And at the software level, you can actually induce these bit flips without anyone being aware of it and take advantage of those bit flips to take over the system which is not nice. Uh, 
Okay, so let me go into a little bit more detail. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. So if you don't understand it right now, you will understand it hopefully in the next lecture. But basically, this is a fundamental problem. And in memory chips, you have rows of cells. We're going to see this later on also. And if you want to access some data in some row, you need to activate that row, which means that you need to apply high voltage to that row. Now, if you want to access some other data in some other row, you deactivate this row, which means that you need to apply low voltage to that row. Now, if you keep doing this repeatedly, this is essentially a read sequence. Basically, you're reading a row and closing it. Now, if you keep doing it repeatedly, read, close, read, close, read, close, read, close, read, close, read, close, high voltage, low voltage, high voltage, low voltage, high voltage, low voltage. It turns out adjacent cells, meaning some. Hammer draw, we call this the victim rows. And we basically said that if, you can, if you're able to do this hammering enough times before the cells get, uh, uh, can you hear me? I, I have a question mark somewhere. Uh, can, can someone uh, uh, indicate that they're hearing me? Yes, we can hear. Okay, okay, great, thanks. Because I, I, I also received a message saying that my internet connection is not stable. I don't know why, because I'm connected to ethernet. That should be fast. Okay, good. It, People froze, are hearing me. it froze for a moment, but now it works again. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. If so, if at any point, for some reason, it freezes and you cannot hear me, please let me know immediately. Well, uh, assuming it doesn't work within a second or so, uh, so that uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't go forward. Okay. So basically, we showed that more than 80% of the chips are vulnerable to this effect uh, that are manufactured by three major manufacturers, ABC. And there are only three major manufacturers in the world, uh, Samsung, Hynix, and Micron. Not necessarily ABC, but those are the three. So basically, all of the, uh, more than 80% of the chips that are in the market are vulnerable to this problem. So let me quickly say why this problem is happening. This problem is happening because cells are very close to each other. Cells are too close to each other. As a result, they're not isolated from each other. So whenever you do this toggling on the word line on this row over here, you're really causing disturbance in adjacent, physically adjacent rows and the noise vulnerability of the cells have reduced because they're too small today. And this is a technology scaling problem. So we're gonna talk about this more, but let me talk about the higher level implications of this very quickly. Basically, when we wrote the paper seven years ago, we said that uh, memory isolation is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system and access to one memory address should not have unintended side effects on data stored in other addresses. And we basically said that someone can hijack your computer based on what we have shown in this paper. And while we were working on that hijacking, these Google folks from Google Project Zero essentially showed that. They basically said they learned about the problem from our paper, and they basically said that they could take over a system uh, without, at, at, the, at the user level just by inducing and exploiting these bit flips so that they can circumvent memory protection. So I'm not going to talk about this in detail. This is actually fascinating. This should not happen clearly, right? Whenever you're reading memory, no other location should change. Whenever you're writing to memory, no other location should also change. But here, you're reading memory. You're not even writing. But some other location is changing. And that some other location may be belong to the operating system, may belong to some other program, may belong to your own program. So in the end, basically, you get something that's not good. It could be bad for reliability. It could be bad for security, as we discussed. So this is now known as the rope hammer problem. And a very famous hacker on the internet basically talked about this problem by saying it's like breaking into an apartment by repeatedly slamming a neighbor's door until the vibrations open the door you were after. And I like this analogy. It's a beautiful analogy. Uh, so if you're stuck in a room ever and the door is locked, start banging on the walls. And uh, assuming that uh, the same sort of disturbance exists between the door and the walls, uh, well, hopefully the door will magically open because the vibrations that are caused by the disturbance that you create on the walls will open the door, right? Okay, that's an analogy clearly. But uh, there are real attacks that are actually built by other folks based on our paper. Uh, these folks at TU Grass show that they can gain unrestricted access to systems of website visitors by taking advantage of Rohammer bit flips in JavaScript. Uh, these folks from uh, Fry University in Amsterdam show that they can deterministically take control of an Android phone if you download their app. And this app actually figures out how to attack you with Rohammer. Uh, and some uh, the similar folks showed that you could do these attacks much faster using GPUs. GPUs are something we're going to talk about later on in this course also. These are massively parallel machines. You will see that they're very fast. 
and they can enable uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, much faster hammering of the rows. Uh, other folks and similar folks actually show that you can do this row hammer attacks over the network. So take over a remote machine by hammering its memory. Similar, uh, some other folks actually, these are competing folks, let's say, they basically show that they could do exactly the same thing. So these are repeated many, many times, as you can see. Uh, more recently, folks show that you can actually leak private data, even if you may not be able to take over the system for whatever reason. And that's equally bad, I would say. And more recently, uh, well, I guess similarly recently, uh, folks have shown that uh, they could uh, essentially uh, 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 take a neural network and uh, uh, reduce its accuracy to a level that this neural network is essentially useless or harmful. So similar papers were written. So this is at Unix Security last year. Basically, these folks say that uh, you have a neural network. It classifies, let's say, I don't know, uh, whatever uh, uh, thing you input to it with 90% accuracy. If you subject it to row hammer attack in a customized way, its accuracy goes down to 10%. So this is really bad, right? Imagine that you're using a neural network to detect a pedestrian in your car, and its accuracy is quite good normally. 90% is not enough. You should really be very close to 100%. But with row hammer attack, it becomes, I don't know, 30% or 10%. That doesn't sound very good, right? So clearly, this sort of uh, reliability and security problem is not good to have in future systems that we rely on. In fact, we rely our lives on, right? So that's why I think this is so critically important. I'm not going to talk about this more, but we're going to go into it as a potential case study in the next lecture. This is the paper that we have written. Uh, actually, we recently wrote a retrospective uh, with Jeremy, my PhD student, on this topic. If you're really interested, you can read it. But actually, this problem did not go away. Uh, recently, we have also shown that this problem is, is becoming worse. Uh, DEM manufacturers actually put in solutions to the problem, but those solutions are not working. This, this work actually showed that those solutions can be bypassed because they're not secure enough, essentially. So we're also working on secure enough solutions. But unfortunately, what DEM was advertised to be secure until 2020 after we wrote our paper. But essentially that security property doesn't hold. So unfortunately this is not good. And we, we also written other papers. If you're interested, we actually have a work that's coming up next week uh, in HPCA that talks about how to securely prevent these row hammer attacks at low cost uh, with a mechanism called block hammer. But again, I'm not gonna uh, talk about these in detail in this course. You can read this uh, on your own if you're interested. It's a fascinating topic. It's a great topic to do research on and actually build your uh, creativity on, let me put it that way, uh, but uh, that's it. So, okay, if you're in really interested in learning, if you, if you cannot wait, and if you really want to learn more about it, uh, this is a recent lecture that I delivered uh, in, a, uh, in the High Peak Conference that talks about the story of Rohammer. And this is essentially covering the state of the art. This was last, uh, uh, last month. Okay, and we have more lectures, so again, uh, this course will not go into a lot of advanced concepts. We're going to use Rohammer to motivate and show that there are important problems at the lower level. There's plenty of room at the bottom, for example. Uh, but if you're really interested, uh, we cover this a lot in uh, the computer architecture advanced course and also in the seminar course, uh, which some of you are going to probably take. Because usually students uh, who take digital design and computer architecture end up taking the seminar. But of course, seminar is limited to only 22 students. Okay. So that was row hammer. So, and that's just one example. But there are other things that have also happened recently. Hope probably more people know about Meltdown and Spectre. How many people know about these uh, examples? Uh, I see some uh, hands that are raised. Uh, yeah, sometimes we will do polls. I figured out how to do polls in Zoom, but uh, maybe we are not going to do that right now. Uh, so these Meltdown and Spectre are also hardware security vulnerabilities at a different abstraction level. Essentially, these happen because of the algorithms that are employed in the microarchitecture of uh, processing, uh, general purpose processing units, and almost all general purpose processing units that are high performance today. So Rohammer was a physical effect, right? It was circuit level. The, this is a microarchitecture level problem that leads to security issues. Essentially, I'm going to give you the high level perspective. Maybe we'll go into a little bit more detail depending on how next lecture and next week pans out. But basically, similar to Rohammer, uh, someone can steal secret data from the system or take over the system potentially, if you're really, really good. I think these attacks are actually harder to do compared to Rohammer attacks because Rohammer leads to a bit flip directly. If you can somehow exploit it, those, that's easy to do. Whereas Spectre and Meltdown, you need to actually really, 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 really know what is really going on in the system to really uh, 
leak the data that you want. Again, I'm not going to go into detail. I'm going to refer you to a paper. But this happens even if your program and data are perfectly correct. Your hardware behaves according to the specification. So that was not true in Rowhammer, right? In Rowhammer, your hardware does not behave according to the specification. Hardware should really not get a bit flip if you're not changing that particular bit. Uh, but meltdown and Spectre happens uh, even when your hardware behaves according to the specification and there are no software vulnerabilities and bugs. So why is this happening? Basically, we're going to actually cover the concepts in this class. We're going to talk about speculative execution, for example, when we talk about pipelining, branch prediction. Uh, existing process speculatively execute programs. Whenever they get to a branch, they don't know which path to go, so they predict which path to go. So they speculatively execute a program, user program, to maximize performance. But the speculative execution leaves traces of secret data in the process cache because during the speculative execution, some locations get accessed, even though the program may not be allowed to access them. So you update your internal storage. We're going to cover caches also in this course. So even if you don't understand anything over here, just understand that we're going to cover a lot of the basics that will be required uh, for someone to launch these meltdown on Spectre attacks. So basically, it brings data that is not supposed to be brought uh, or access if there was no speculative execution. And speculative execution is there for performance reasons. OK, now a malicious program, what it can do is it can inspect the contents of the cache to infer what is the value of the strict secret data uh, uh, that it's not supposed to access. So some other program brings us data, or maybe the malicious program brings the data, depends on how you construct the attack. And then you basically check the contents of the cache to figure out what is the data values. Not good. And actually, uh, you can go even further. If you really know what you're doing, if you know the microarchitecture really well, a malicious program can be constructed to force another program to speculatively execute code that specifically leaves traces of secret data. So you can actually target these attacks very, very carefully. Of course, it's not easy to do these attacks, right? You really need to have an extremely good understanding of the underlying hardware and microarchitecture. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but this is something that's exciting that's happening today. Uh, th I would recommend you take a look at Google Project Zero, Jan Horn's uh, blog post over here, and their papers also on these topics that I did not put over here, but you can find them easily on the web uh, since they're so popular uh, today. Uh, but basically, today, security and privacy are becoming very, very important concerns. Reliability also on top of this. Designing robust systems are much, much more important than ever because we're going to trust our lives, cars, self-driving cars, or many, many different aspects of our lives, decision-making in terms of related to our health, et cetera, uh, for, uh, uh, on these computers, uh, these intelligent systems. So if they're actually vulnerable to this sort of problems, uh, it's not going to be a good future going into the future. So one of the important things, hopefully, that you will get out uh, with the fundamentals in this course is uh, in the back of your minds, actually, at least, how, how do we actually fix these problems going into the future at different levels of the stack, given that you know exactly how the computers are operating today at the end of this course, of course. Okay. Uh, okay. Now let's move on to something else that's happening in computer architecture as well as system. And that's more demanding workloads. I mean, we kind of talked about this, right? We talked about AI, ML, uh, but applications are increasingly demanding. And this is really up to the imagination of people. You dream and applications will come. Uh, so it's actually interesting. There are actually a lot of anecdotal stories that I can tell you. When MIPS R2000 was designed in early 1980s, we're going to cover the ISA MIPS. Uh, uh, and th the first incarnation of it was in early 1980s. Uh, and uh, you're going to do your labs in MIPS, actually, some of your labs in MIPS ISA. So you will learn it. Uh, but MIPS R2000 was a very simple processor. And some folks basically said, this is the best processor we will ever have. Why do we want a more powerful processor than this? Clearly, they have been proven wrong many, many times over, right? So basically, the thinking was that, OK, we have the best applications that we can have. Let's give up. No, that's not going to happen, basically. People will always be dreamers, and they will dream, and they will create new applications. And that's how innovation will proceed going into the future. And these applications will be extremely demanding going into the future, exactly how machine learning was, machine learning training was. Uh, and essentially, uh, there will be a need for increasingly powerful and increasingly efficient and increasingly secure computer architectures because they computing platforms will become increasingly strained as applications uh, push boundaries. So if somebody says that we're done with applications, never trust them. Let me put it that way. <laughs> Dream and you will bring something. Okay, some applications that I think are not very well enabled today are 
these devices, for example. This is nanopore sequencing. This is a sequencing device that you can yourself buy for a thousand bucks, let's say. You can actually start sequencing genomes around you if you're interested, including your own. But basically, these devices are capable of doing high throughput, low latency, or at least low latency by today's standards, uh, processing of genomes, and they generate huge amounts of data. And today, we don't have the capability to actually process this data uh, so that we can do really, really meaningful studies uh, at low latency with them. We can process the data from them uh, waiting for two weeks or, I don't know, hours. But if you want to give this device to a doctor, for example, and a uh, doctor would like to make a critical decision in the life of a patient in terms of what drug to administer to that patient, we cannot do that today. You cannot, do the you cannot make the decision within a minute. You have to wait, I don't know, depending on the complexity of the analysis and depending on the question, sometimes you may not be able to get the answer because you don't have enough data. But if you are able to get the answer, it may take days, uh, weeks, uh, or, or if you're lucky, hours, basically. Minutes are not uh, imaginable. But I believe minutes have, uh, have importance, basically, because there are cases where you need to critically decide. And also, uh, if you reduce the latency of these things, you can enable the uh, speed of innovation, right? Even if you're not constrained by a decision that you need, to, you need to make a minute, if you're actually able to generate new insight uh, quickly uh, within minutes, then you can actually uh, in, uh, increase the level of innovation and speed of innovation in science also. Okay, so these are genome sequencers and they're mainly bottleneck by data. So there's a huge performance energy bottleneck, but I believe these applications are going to become increasingly important. So another reason why we care, this is actually a slide that I first used in the digital design and computer architecture course Last year, uh, I think I used it in the first week of February. You can see that uh, the date over here. Uh, but basically, that was one of our uh, uh, that was one of the earlier lectures, uh, in-person lectures at the time. And basically, I mentioned that there is this COVID-19 outbreak, and sequencing is becoming very important. Uh, and people actually, you can see in this news item, uh, nanopore sequencer are shipped to China at the time. It was only in China at the time or it was only said to be in China at the time. Uh, and uh, people were actually using these nanopore sequencers to actually understand what's going on uh, with the outbreak uh, and the evolution of the disease uh, at that time. So clearly this, these sequencers have been used many, 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 many times over the last year. So they're proven their worth, but unfortunately they're still not capable enough in the sense that we cannot really analyze the data efficiently and quickly enough inside the device, for example. So there's a lot more to do in these platforms. And uh, you can imagine doing population scale <laughs> profiling, microbiome profiling, so that you can understand what's going on. You can, you can predict outbreaks potentially if you're actually able to do that. So this is one example paper. I'm not going to expect you to read the paper, but these folks collected samples, for example, from the New York City subway. And they basically tried to understand the bacterial diversity uh, in the New York City in different areas. So these are enabled by these genome sequence analysis devices uh, or RNA analysis devices, et cetera. Essentially, these devices that do uh, sequencing. Uh, but clearly, it took, a, it, took, it took them a long, long, long time to be able to do that. So these are some applications of these uh, devices. Of course, we're very much bottleneck by computation and platforms today. And this is another example. This looks like old news, but this is actually a paper that was published in Nature in 2016 related to the Ebola outbreak. You can see that the title of the paper is Real-Time Portable Genome Sequencing for Ebola Surveillance. Now, this sounds familiar, right? Uh, today, we're dealing with COVID-19, not Ebola. But uh, you can see what portable means. This is portability. <laughs> you can put it on a cart. And you can see what real-time is. Well, I guess you need to read the paper, but it's not really real-time. What I consider real-time would be a minute, let's say, or a second. Uh, in this case, it's more like a day or maybe longer. So they kind of set up an office to actually do the Ebola outbreak uh, surveillance in Guinea uh, over here. And, and I think it's fascinating how the technology is going to evolve into the future. Uh, at that time, nanopore sequences were not as uh, common uh, at the time. But I think we need much more powerful uh, sequencers and uh, sequencing platforms. And these are some other sequencers that I, I'm not going to talk about here. And all produce data with different properties. So doing sequencing inside the device is becoming interesting. And you can see the sequencer over here that you can plug into your cell phone, right? Uh, so I think the future is very bright in terms of technology. And this is actually an example of there's plenty of room at the bottom, right? You can see that these sequencers are operating at the very, very low uh, uh, nano scales, 
uh, very similar to what was envisioned by uh, Feynman in his 1959 talk. And clearly that's happening. And I think more is going to happen. But in order to enable what's coming out of those sequencers, we really need to do a lot on the top at the algorithms and higher level sides, as well as the system designs. So I think uh, these sequencers, the cost of sequencing has been reducing dramatically. In, uh, soon we will see Moore's law. Moore's law basically specifies how fast uh, the transistor, uh, the cost of a transistor is reducing. You can see the curve is like this. Oh, it's exponential actually, but it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a, a log scale over here. That's why it looks linear over here. But basically the cost of sequencing is actually reducing a lot more, a lot faster today. So it's actually much, a much bigger exponential than Moore's law. As a result, we can sequence many more genomes. The question is, can we actually do something really, really intelligent about them quickly, such that we can enable much better scientific discovery and much better health and medical applications. I think we're very limited by computation today, actually. We've been working on this area for some time now, since actually almost 20, 12 years now, right now, more than 12 years, 12, 14 years, I should say. But there are some papers that we have written recently. FPGAs, which we're going to use in the labs of this course, are actually going to be important computational devices to improve the efficiency and performance of genome sequence analysis. Uh, In-memory computation is going to be also very important in genome sequence analysis, as you can see in these works. Uh, algorithm architecture co-design is going to be very, very important. This is an example of algorithm architecture co-design. This is the mo a more recent example of algorithm architecture co-design uh, that can work on CPUs, GPUs, and FPGAs. And we're interested in doing it on in-memory computation also going forward. Uh, this is another algorithm architecture co-design for approximate string matching, which can be used for many tasks in genomics, bioinformatics, and also text, et cetera. Uh, so basically the future is very bright, I think. And I think it's enabled by both bottom as well as the top. So remember the axiom we had, I think this is another example, but people are dreaming of these applications essentially. Let me quickly spend some more time. These slides I did not use at the time because these were not available uh, last year when I was giving uh, the earlier lectures that I showed you a slide from. Uh, but basically this is what's claimed by the Nanopore uh, tech company, they basically say whole genome sequencing or uh, COVID-19 takes seven hours. Uh, okay, this is debatable, I think, depending on what analysis you do, of course. If your analysis is huge, like you're comparing uh, millions of different genomes, then I think you're lucky to do it one hour. Uh, but basically, they say it takes seven hours from RNA to answer. But even seven hours is too uh, slow, I would argue. In fact, uh, they have this nice picture over here that where they talk about, talk about metagenomic nanopore sequencing, basically. You basically characterize co-infecting bacteria and viruses, identify correlation and risk factors of different patients, research potential to, uh, future treatment implications. Uh, you can also investigate what might cause different responses based on different genomes. Uh, and you can also track potential mutations, et cetera. To be able to do all of that, it's not seven hours. It'll take you much, much longer than that, seven days, even more, right? So it's, it's actually, we're very much bottlenecked today by the computing platforms, even though the fundamental sequencing technology is able to produce data very quickly, as you can see over here. These folks claim that you can sequence only within one hour, right? So the fundamental sequencing technology is not bad, but the analysis is actually much longer today, depending on the analysis that you want to do. Okay, so uh, if you're really interested in this area, we're not going to talk a lot more about this in this course, but I think all of the fundamentals that you will learn in this course would be useful for enabling applications like this. But uh, we recently written the short survey paper that talks about issues in accelerating genome analysis uh, in a broad perspective. And I've also recently, last uh, month, delivered a lecture that covers even more issues in genome analysis. Uh, if you're interested, you can actually take a look at those. But none of this is required, actually. Uh, this is just for your benefits, uh, if you're interested in these areas. Because I think there's huge potential for uh, uh, people like you who are just newcomers into the field to understand uh, and improve after learning the fundamentals, uh, the state of the art, because we really need those improvements going into the future. Okay, and of course, as I mentioned, we cover uh, this sort of stuff really in the more advanced course, computer architecture and the seminar in computer architecture, and you can take a look at those later. Okay, so genome sequence analysis is clearly a very, very constraining application, but there are other applications today we're very constrained uh, at, uh, like databases. Clearly, all of you are using these applications knowingly or unknowingly. Databases are not scaling very well. Graph and tree processing is not scaling very well. Uh, clearly, their data center workloads. All of these applications are shown to be bottlenecked in terms of performance and energy by data uh, and uh, 
existing computational platforms, essentially. Now, if you look at the mobile end, the story is very similar, actually. Uh, these are some old applications, but you can imagine innovating new applications, right? Chrome, TensorFlow, uh, machine learning frameworks, uh, video playback and capture, which is what we're doing right now, actually. We're all doing video playback and capture in our systems, and we're all experiencing the bottlenecks internally. I guess we're lucky that we have uh, constant power. If you didn't have constant power, unfortunately, what we're doing right now wouldn't have been feasible, uh, for example, or if we were really power constrained, uh, that wouldn't have been really feasible. If some of you may be power constrained, you may be watching this on a device that's very power constrained, and as a result, you may not be getting great quality. I don't know. But basically, all of these applications are in the end are bottlenecked by data and performance and energy is literally bottlenecked by uh, the capability of today's computation platforms. If you want to really take them to the next level, for example, if you want to have a very intelligent learning engine on your cell phone uh, and enable training of your uh, of big models in your cell phone so that you can actually learn something important about your health, et cetera, such that this thing can actually really integrate with you as opposed to uh, you querying this thing once in a while, then actually we're, we're far away from that. Okay, so uh, let me give you some number related to the study that we did with Google over the course of one and a half years. This was published in 2018. And we studied these four workloads that I showed you over here together with Google. And we basically showed that more than 60% of the total system energy is spent on data movement on these workloads. Real workloads, real input sets executed on real devices, uh, mobile devices. Now this I believe is unacceptable. You are consuming 60% just to move the data to the computation units across the memory heart. So this will become more clear when we cover how a computation unit gets the data, but imagine that 60% is a big fraction, right? Okay, uh, let's see. So uh, I'll give you one other data point over here in today's systems. Uh, basically, uh, this is a picture that analyzes the cost in terms of energy of different operations. So you're gonna see some of these operations. Uh, well, maybe not the double precision floating point operation, but imagine that this is a floating point addition. It's an addition uh, on a big number, 64 bits. It takes about 20 picojoules today. Now a memory read or write to bring the data that's needed by uh, that operation, just one element, to bring one element is 16 nanojoules. Now, if you do the calculation, that's an 800 X difference. So a memory access today is actually somewhere between two to three orders of magnitude the energy, it consumes the energy of a, a complex addition. So that's a lot basically. So that is unfortunate. And now your data access is really consuming a lot of your energy. And also it takes a lot of latency, which is not reflected in this picture. Uh, okay, so it's good to keep this in mind because we're gonna later talk about computation, memory access, how you actually fundamentally enable it. And we're gonna bring a lot of data into the processor so that we can process it. But maybe that's not a good design choice, right? In the future, Maybe there will be processing in memory engines so that you don't actually bring the data, you actually move the computation to the data because doing the computation is much less costly in terms of energy compared to moving the data. Uh, now, uh, very briefly, I must also mention that this picture was very different 70 or 80 years ago. So if you were taking this class in its current form 70 or 80 years ago, uh, your instructor would have been tell telling you that a complex addition operation is about two orders of magnitude more costly than a memory access. So that's two orders of magnitude, uh, worse uh, energy for computation to memory access. Today, it's exactly the opposite. Two to three orders of magnitude, worse energy for memory access compared to computation. So why did this happen over the course of 70, 80 years? And the answer is technology scaling. Essentially, uh, we will talk about Gordon Moore and Moore's law. Moore's law and technology scaling, the ability to reduce the size of a logic gate and a transistor in CMOS technology enabled us to do essentially that, reduce the size uh, uh, of that logic circuit, which reduces its latency, which also reduces its power consumption. So we basically did that very, very successfully over the course of 70, 80 years. As a result, these arithmetic units became extremely efficient, but unfortunately we weren't able to do that as well with memory for reasons we will discuss later because memory is not completely logic. So it doesn't scale as well as logic. Okay, keep that in mind. That's another historical perspective that I wanted to give you. So if you were taking this class 70, 80 years ago, you, it might be actually very worthwhile to work on computation and its efficiency, not today. Today, actually, you're in a very different trade-off space. 
it's really all about memory access in many applications. Of course, some applications are computation bottlenecks. Sure, there you need to work on computation. But today, it's very much about memory access and your bottleneck by memory access. So it makes a lot of sense to figure out how to deal with that. As a result, you can see exactly the example architectures that I showed you, the Cerebras wafer scale engine. The goal is to bring computation and memory together as much as possible so that you don't go off chip, such that your AI accelerator becomes efficient. Uh, in Samsung's FIMD RAM function memory DRAM designed for AI applications, essentially the same goal in a different way. They basically design a memory chip that can do floating point multiply and accumulate operations as opposed to doing those operations in the CPU here. Uh, similar to UPMEM, UPMEM architecture, right? Uh, essentially the same idea in the end in different realizations. Okay, so keep that in mind. So today, many interesting things are happening in computer architecture because of all these reasons. I've given you a tour of it. Uh, now, let me actually conclude uh, uh, relatively quickly. Basically, many novel concepts are investigated today. I gave you some examples. There are new computing paradigms. We want to rethink the full stack, processing in memory, processing near data, neuromorphic computing, fundamentally secure and dependable computers. And there are more that I don't include over here. Quantum computing is one example that's a bit farther out, I think. Uh, and it's not as general purpose, uh, frankly, as some of these other uh, things like processing in memory. Uh, there are new accelerators, algorithm hardware co-designs for important applications like graphs, graph analytics, artificial intelligence and machine learning, obviously, and genome analysis going forward. And there are new memories and storage systems like we discussed, non-volatile main memory, processing in memory, intelligence inside the memory, using machine learning concepts to improve system decisions uh, in memories as well as architectures. So uh, this list can be expanded. I gave you some sampling over here. But basically, applications are not a problem. We're dreaming, and applications are coming. There will be more. And trade-offs are becoming increasingly diverging and complex. I gave you the example. I'm not going to elaborate on that again. So we need to actually think differently going into the future. So hopefully, in this course, we are able to uh, give you the ammunition to think critically and differently so that you're not optimizing the wrong thing. So if your application is bottleneck by memory, go and optimize memory. If your application is bottleneck by computation, go and optimize computation, right? Uh, if your application is bottleneck by neither, but you really have security problems, go and fix your security problems first. Uh, usually your application is bottleneck by one of them, by the way, computation or memory. Uh, okay, and increasingly complex systems we have today. Past systems look kind of like this is a general purpose system, but you have processors, main memory, storage. Modern systems are increasingly heterogeneous. You have heterogeneous cores inside a processor. Uh, you have dynamic and static heterogeneity. You can dynamically change the frequency and voltage. You can dynamically enable and disable cores. Uh, you can have GPUs uh, over here. You can have multiple different types of GPUs also. You can have FPGAs, reconfigurable logic. You can have multiple different components connected to memories that are also heterogeneous. Some memories are fast, some memories are slow. And then you have some persistent memory and storage, which may, or, which may also include the non-volatile memory. So modern systems are increasingly complex and heterogeneous, basically. So they're not easy to manage, but they enable much more opportunity than before. So as a result, computing landscape today is very different from 20, 10 to 20 years ago, even five years ago, actually. Uh, a lot of the innovations that I showed you happened in 2019, 2021 timeframe. Uh, and as I, again, this slide I already used, applications and technology both demand novel architectures. And as a result of everything that I described, every component and its interfaces as well as entire system designs are being re-examined today. So uh, I'm going to conclude with the set of motivating slides. I believe uh, as newcomers to the field, you can revolutionize the way computers are built or how we think about computing actually in general. If you really understand both the way hardware and the software are designed should be designed and how you should really change each accordingly. You can really invent new paradigms for computation, communication and storage. And this can enable really big changes in the fields. And uh, again, I, I recommend a lot of uh, stuff uh, in my lectures, as you can see, this is another book that I would recommend. It was written by Thomas Kuhn. It's a philosophy of science book. It basically covers a lot of scientific revolutions in physics, chemistry, astronomy, et cetera. It basically analyzes the structure of them. It basically says that, uh, there are some cases where science is not satisfactory because there is no clear consensus in the field. And scientists try desperately to find something that, un that explains the phenomena. Uh, and hopefully, they would like to be in normal science. There's a dominant theory that's used to explain things, business as usual. For example, the, the sun, uh, the, uh, the earth revolves around the sun, right? This is something that we take for granted. 
this was not something that we should have taken for granted if we were living 800 years ago or 1,000 years ago, right? Uh, at some point, uh, this was questioned, and uh, uh, there were exceptions. There was a lot of evidence uh, that built up such that uh, people started thinking, oh, it's actually uh, the Earth is rather, uh, uh, the sun is not revolving around the Earth, actually. It's the other way around. And over time, there's a lot of resistance, clearly. There's always resistance against uh, good science. And as a result, uh, people basically uh, say uh, there's no dominant theory. But at some point, revolutionary science emer emerges and people start re examining the underlying assumptions that have been there in place for a long time. And they design new things that can lead to new paradigms. Today, for example, I believe there is no clear consensus in the field of computer architecture in terms of how to best execute workloads and how to best design the systems because it becomes very application specific. Now, 20 years ago uh, or 30 years ago, the consensus was clear. We have a single core system, as we will see in this lecture, early part of these lectures. You optimize that single core system that executes a single thread as much as possible. You maximize its performance and you're done. It's good at general purpose applications. But today, the, uh, the landscape is extremely different. That single core system did not work well uh, for energy, did not work well for new applications. It did not scale. Uh, so technology scaling issues uh, made sure that there was a lot of complexity in the design. So basically, that consensus disappeared. Now we are in the revolutionary science where uh, we're really re-examining new paradigms for computer architecture. And I think I would also say computing in general, because you're going to be taking some theory of computing courses. So if you take theory of computing courses, you mainly talk about the number of operations to discuss the complexity of algorithms, right? But maybe that's not the right way, right? It's good to question critically. If what you're really bottleneck is the data and not the operations that you're doing, like I showed you earlier, maybe you should really rethink the fundamentals of uh, uh, the theory of computation also. The big O notation, some of you may be exposed to it, for example. The big O notation counts the number of operations to uh, determine the complexity of an algorithm. Well, maybe that's not the best way going forward. And this is Thomas Kuhn, and this is his book, if you're interested. So let me conclude with this slide. Today, I believe it's an exciting time to be understanding and designing computing architectures. There are many challenging and exciting pro problems in platform design that no one has tackled or even thought about before, actually. And th this can have huge impact on the world's future. As you can imagine, right? We're all relying on AI, machine learning, self-driving, whatever you can imagine. And today, we have a lot of new applications. We're driven by a huge hunger for data, big data, hopefully for good reasons. But clearly, technology is agnostic uh, to morality or ethics. There are people who will have bad reasons to actually mine the data, but there are good reasons for doing so also. Uh, so bad reasons should really not deter us from developing the technology. We should just need to be careful about how we potentially are uh, protected against those bad reasons, right? Uh, that's why privacy and security are very important. Uh, so there's a huge hunger. There are new applications, as we discussed. There's a need for even greater realism uh, and we can today easily collect more data than we can analyze and understand. So, and that's straining our platforms a lot. So that's one thing. This is the application perspective, workload perspective, data perspective, right? At the lower level, this is a top down. At the lower level, bottom up, we're experiencing significant difficulties in keeping up with the demands of the workloads uh, at the technology layer. There are energy problems, reliability problems, complexity problems, security problems, scalability problems. And basically that's why we need to consider both the top workloads, algorithms, et cetera, and system software, et cetera, and the bottom, which is really the devices, circuits, logic, and architecture is right in the middle of all of that. It really enables you to actually bridge the gap between algorithms and the devices, such that you can exploit the capabilities of both in the best ways. That's why I find architecture to be really exciting, both where it is today, as well as it being in the middle of the stack, and it's really enabling uh, the algorithms on top enabling the technologies at the bottom, enabling both of them to meet in between such that you can solve real problems going into the future. Okay, so this is a really great time to stop. I did not take a break this time, so you can use the remaining time for break. In the future, we'll try to take some break. We'll, we'll figure out a good way. Uh, but in the next lecture, we're gonna start with some puzzles. Uh, hopefully they will be interesting. Uh, we will still try to motivate. Uh, and uh, after that, we're going to talk about the labs uh, and go into transistor as a building block.
I guess before we part, are there any questions, like burning questions that uh, I should answer? Okay. So there's one question, is lab taking place tomorrow? I do not believe so, but uh, maybe Juan can chime in or Hassan can chime in. Yes, labs will start on uh, Tuesday, the 9th of uh, March. That will be the, the first lab. Okay, there's another question. How and when will the lab groups be formed? Maybe Juan, you can take that also. Yeah, you can, you, you're gonna get uh, um, an announcement about that very, very soon. Okay, yes. <laughs> Yeah, you, please make sure that you check your email. Uh, we're going to email you through Moodle on all of these course logistics that you may be wondering about. Uh, and then uh, you need to act quickly. And very, very importantly, uh, if you actually uh, have taken the labs and done well, please don't do the labs again, because I think that'll alleviate uh, uh, you from going through the same thing again, basically. So should we do any reading already in the books? I will mention that uh, later on, basically. Uh, uh, so you will, uh, yes, you will need to do reading. A lot of them are optional, but I think if you would like to learn more, uh, then yes, uh, it's, it's always good to do the readings, I will suggest. Sometimes there will be clearly overlap between the readings uh, and the lectures. So then I think you need to take your initiative and figure out how much overlap there is and decide what to do. So there's one more question. I didn't do the exam last year, but I did the labs. Can I still get it from previous year? My guess is yes, but please email Juan uh, personally and CC me. Yeah, the answer is yes. And okay. if you did the labs last year, your lab grade is in, in Moodle 2020. So you can check there. Okay. By so the way, I... the, the labs uh, website is also up um, in, our school, in our course website and, and you can find some of these answers there. Okay, yeah, I think course website is important. I didn't go through that, but I will do that uh, later on when we cover the logistics, but you can find the course website. I think that was emailed. Uh, there are two books that are uh, assigned also, you can find on the course website. Uh, again, uh, it depends on which topic we're covering. So uh, the, the way the course is structured, it's really not following any single book. It follows Harris and Harris for some time. So I would recommend going through Harris and Harris, but we also leverage some material from uh, Pat and Patel. Uh, so look at the study materials online uh, uh, and you can learn from the book, certainly. I mean, uh, there's, stuff, there's stuff in the book that is not present in the lectures and there's stuff in the lectures that's not present in the book, but later half of the lecture will diverge from both of the books. So we will cover some paradigms like SIMD, GPU, systolic arrays, uh, memory, well, memory is part of it, will be similar to the books, but not all parts of it. Uh, so basically, uh, you, will, you will actually uh, need to decide on your own uh, 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 how to treat the recommended and required materials. In the end, uh, you should take this as a learning experience. If you have time to study all the books, I believe it's good because both books are good, actually. Both books are good books. Uh, like this lecture is in neither of these books uh, because these books are old. Uh, but both books tell you good things and you will learn. Uh, but that's not necessarily uh, things that uh, will be covered in the lecture also. But whenever possible, I will tell you which, and, and the slides will tell you which books actually we, uh, we, will, we will follow. And which parts of the books we will follow. Okay. Any, uh, I guess there's one more question. If you're taking this course for the first time, uh, we don't have to do anything on Moodle. Is that correct, Juan? I'm not sure. I think you will still need to do something depending on the instructions that we'll send related to the labs. So you will need to choose your partners, for example. Yeah, exactly. That's, uh, you will get an announcement very soon. Yeah, yeah. So follow sure your- before, before the end of the week. Yeah, yeah, follow your email very closely and make sure you act quickly because that's going to be important. It's going to be important to work with a partner that you know. Uh, I would suggest because uh, clearly we're in a special situation, right? The corona crisis. If you know your partner and if you can work with them well uh, together, uh, potentially when you're, uh, that'd be good. Uh, I would I would recommend that uh, because the probability of uh, 
I mean, I mean the, the probability of you meeting them will be better if you somehow know them personally, right? Of course, you can meet them online uh, and there are interesting things you can do, right? We, we, will, we will be working with FPGAs in the lab, so it'll, it's going to be physical. But uh, clearly, only one of you can have the FPGA at the same time. You don't have enough FPGAs for everyone, unfortunately. Uh, so you can actually decide how to actually handle that. Uh, and I'd recommend uh, thinking of that once you get the FPGAs. OK, so I think this is a good time to uh, finish up. Uh, we've already finished up, but I think this was important, the answer. Uh, I will see you all tomorrow. Take care.